today in the Song of Solomon, and we get to complete this story of romance. Now, in these uh, final chapters, we're going to see the emphasis is on the power of love, the power of love, and that God wants us to use this power that we have in love that he's given us and our love of him for good, because he does. God uses love uh, for good. Um, we're going to be instructed here to be careful with love. As a matter of fact, a little phrase that I would like you to remember here is uh, to handle it responsibly. It's like uh, I was thinking um, this morning, it's sort of like when somebody learns how to use a weapon, you know, a gun, and you go out, and the first thing, you guys know that if you've ever done this before, the first thing that they teach you when you're learning how to fire a weapon is what? how to be safe with it, right? Where the safety is and not to point it at anybody and, you know, and those kind of things. And you're supposed to handle it responsibly because this is a dangerous thing or it can be uh, a dangerous uh, thing. And like that, in some ways, love can really be a blessing or it can be really used uh, uh, wrongly. And so we're going to actually be shown here a few ways to express our love and handle it responsibly uh, and it's actually going to bless those that receive our love as well as the one who's giving it. And I'm going to take you through three ways in these two chapters uh, to, um, as I said, handle your love re uh, responsibly. And the first one that I'm going to show you is to express what you're thinking. To actually express what uh, you're thinking because God does. He's our example. Uh, God doesn't hold back in what he's thinking about you and how he loves you. He edifies you openly, and, and we're going to show see that uh, example. Uh, also, secondly, we'll see to establish your commitment with one another. And this is geared towards married couples primarily, but you can apply it in a broad range. And, and God wants you to, to ex establish your commitment because, again, God does this. He is fully committed to you. And uh, we can uh, express our love um, by showing that we fully uh, are committed to our spouse in this case. And then thirdly, um, we'll see that we're supposed to spend some focused time together. And again, because that's God's desire. He loves to spend time with you. And so I'll point these out as we go. Um, but let's begin here in Song of Solomon uh, chapter 7, verse 1. And we're told, how beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. The curves of your thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a skillful workman. Your navel is a rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. Your waist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks towards Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel, and the hair of your head is like purple. A king is held captive by your tresses. Okay, I should explain a few things here. Uh, the, the, this book of the Bible is all about romantic love between a husband and his wife. These two that recently married, and there's a lot of romance going on, and uh, the, the whole uh, book is really a song of two people talking to each other, going back and forth, and talking about each other, and every once in a while their friends will chime in, like, yeah, praise the Lord, <laughs> kind of a thing, and, uh, and so that's what it is primarily, a love story between two people, an actual one, but it's also an allegory of the relationship between uh, Israel and God, or also Jesus and the church. It depends upon how uh, you look at it. And so, knowing that, here the husband is speaking to his wife. And uh, he's just basically saying, I like everything about you. <laughs> Isn't that what he's saying? You know, as he should. You that are married, especially you guys, you should like everything about your wife, I think. And he, and he shows that he does. He talks about her feet, right? And her, her belly button, her waist, her breasts, her, her hair, even her nose. I think that's a compliment that it's like a tower of Lebanon. Is that, you know? What a nice big tower nose you have there, sweetie. 
I suppose that meant something nice to them. <laughs> For us, it's sort of lost in translation. But did you notice that he starts at her feet and works his way up? I think that's cool. Because it's just, I think, to point out to us that he appreciates all of her. Now, to me, the point here, and this is the first one that I want to point out to you when I talk about how to handle our love responsibly and the power of it that we have. The first point, and this is directed mostly to you guys, because it's a guy speaking here, is to say what you're thinking, to express these good things. Because sometimes I feel like we hold it to ourselves too much. You know, this is the third time in Song of Solomon that he's gone on a, a long journey through how much he appreciates the way that his wife looks and how uh, she is. And she only did it once for him. And so I think that can kind of show, if you compare that, that we need to know that we should let our bride know uh, to assure them of how beautiful that we think we, they are, you know, um, their, 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 their individual beauty toward the, for us, you know. What I mean is it's one thing to think that your wife is lovely, but you also need to say it sometimes. Guys are able to think, I think, you know, just generally speaking. Guys are able to think that we appreciate our wife, but then not really say it. You know, like, well, I told her she was beautiful when we got married 10 years ago. How often do I need to say this? <laughs> or whatever, you know, every Christmas? One thing the Lord urges us to do in this example, I think, is to specifically point out the things that you appreciate and find attractive about your girl. And so uh, you guys can do it. <laughs> Use your imagination. If you need some help, you can tell her her navel is a rounded goblet or something like that. That's what he did. You can try it. Something. Well, he continues, he's not done. Look at verse 6. He says, How fair and how pleasant you are, O love, with uh, your delights. This stature of yours is like a palm tree, and your breasts like its clusters. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. Let now your breasts be like clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and the roof of your mouth like the best wine. Well, he just really wants her, doesn't he? <laughs> He especially likes her breasts, apparently. <laughs> now, this is in the Bible for a number of reasons, but here's two general ones. Number one, we're supposed to understand that uh, the love, the intimate love between two people is a very good thing. <laughs> and then also that God shows us these things to show us how much he loves us. And, and some of these things are like an, an, an analogy to help us understand just how much God does love us. Because it's all, written all different ways throughout the Bible. For example, I just ran across in Isaiah when Isaiah is speaking to Israel about this. And in Isaiah 62.5, the prophet said, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. God rejoices over people especially those in his family. and It's like a, a, a groom with his bride, and it's just so sweet. And so we see things like that to remind us just how much God loves us. And, and it's because there's great power when we know that God loves us. It can transform a person's life. It's transformed my life to know that God loves me so much. But the immediate application here is between two people. And I'm reminded, we ought to be reminded here, that sex is supposed to be enjoyable. <laughs> I don't know where, where it got in the church at, at some point that this is not a good thing. Because it is a good thing, as long as it's in the context of marriage and a husband and wife. It's, it's interesting to me that God could have done things differently, but he made this intimate act so enjoyable for us. And he made us attractive to one another, you know, men attracted to women, women attracted to men, and it's, it's a good thing, and we ought to uh, um, celebrate that, I think. Chuck Smith, who started Calvary Chapel in the 60s, uh, I, that's where I got saved in that church out in California, he used to say, if Eve wasn't attractive, 
uh, when God brought her to Adam, uh, Adam would have said, nice to meet you. I'm going fishing. <laughs> Whatever you're going to do, I don't know. <laughs> but is that what he said? No, he's like, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Who is that? <laughs> you know, thank you, God. And, and those things just point us to, in the New Testament, how it says the marriage bed is undefiled. When it's in the context of marriage, it's a sweet, lovely, beautiful thing that God has given us to enjoy with each other. And so I just really think Solomon's trying to describe how wonderful it is and keep it PG here, you know. Oh, as a side note, and then I'll move on. In Proverbs 5, it tells us that there's another benefit to the intimate relationship that we have with one another. And it tells us that uh, if we are enjoying each other like this in a healthy sexual way in our marriage, that it's much more difficult for someone else to come between you. You see, this intimacy that God has given you guys that are married, um, it's a protection for your marriage too. And it's really sweet when you think of it like that, what God has done. Okay, so now she responds here in the rest of verse 9 and into 10. Let's look at that together. Uh, the Shulamite is who she's called. We don't know her name. Uh, she says, The wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Well, it appears that they're asleep together, and she's just sort of enjoying the fact that she has security with him, and she's just contented in what she has in her husband. And you know why? <laughs> Well, she tells us there in verse 10, because she knows that she belongs to him. She's satisfied with him. She says it's because his desire is towards me. Did you see that there? And this is a good time for us to stop and think, whether you're a man or a woman, who is your desire towards? You know, are you satisfied with the spouse that God gave you? I'm speaking to married couples primarily this morning. Or are you looking around at others, dissatisfied with what things are like at home? Or maybe it's more for you about your career. That's what goes first. Or your ministry. Those of us in the ministry can fall into that too. I watched a guy recently with his wife at some sort of city event that we were at. And, and all the guy did the whole time was look at his phone. His desire was towards something like email or text or social media, but it wasn't towards his wife, at least not while I was watching. Now one day, I predict, if that continues, that wife, who he loves, apparently, will grow cold towards him. And he'll probably be like, what? What did I do? Well, he should have paid attention to these things. His desire should be towards her. You see, I'm of the belief, and again, I'm speaking primarily to the guys at this juncture, that I believe that husbands get the wife that they create. That God has given you a great responsibility, men, and you're supposed to handle that power that you have responsibly. And so it can go two ways. You can have a real blessing at home. A wife who's secure like she is and, and empowered and loved and just full of grace and, and care. Or you can go the other way. And a lot of it has to do with where your desire is towards. It's a good time to think about that. You know, we can say the same things about our relationship with God. <laughs> The Bible tells us in, in many different ways, I am his and his desire is towards us. You know, and isn't there power when you know that about your king? The power of God is demonstrated through his great love. That's one of the reasons why we celebrated communion this morning, is to remind us of that. That, that he went to the cross for us while we were sinners. God's desire was towards you way before you loved him. But he always loved you with this intense, sacrificial love that never ceases. And hallelujah that we have that. And so I think it's a good time to examine our desires. 
What is it towards? Is your, is your desire towards God and then toward that person that he's put in your life to love? I think that she's done um, the second way here. I said I was going to show you three different ways to uh, uh, express or handle responsibly this power that we have of love that we're given. And uh, the second one here is she's showing us this, um, that she's establishing commitment. She's showing that her husband has established commitment towards her. And that's why she feels the way she does, just so secure and loved and, 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 and special, you know. And husbands and wives both need to know that their spouse is committed to the relationship. It's interesting how she's done it if you've been tracking along in Song of Solomon with us. If you remember back in chapter 2, she said at one point, my beloved is mine and I am his. And then in chapter 7, she said it differently. She said, I am his and he is mine. You see what happened? It flipped. As she began to gain appreciation for how her husband has committed himself to her, she, the emphasis was more on, on him, Right? and less on her. And now, look what it says in what we just read in verse 10. She says, I belong to him, and his desire is towards me. She's no longer even speaking about what's hers anymore. And it's because she just can rejoice in this power of love and how he's handling it responsibly and and just pouring it out on his wife. And and I'd say that this is what makes people grow in their relationship together, that, uh, that commitment that's established between those two. And I'd also say that's what makes you guys grow in Jesus, too, when you realize how much he's committed himself to you and and you can begin to appreciate how much God really loves you. Well, she goes on in verse 11, I'll read to 13, and she says, Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine has budded. Whether the grape blossoms are open and the pomegranates are in bloom, there I will give you my love. The mandrakes give off a fragrance, and at our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner, new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. Okay, they're going to go off on some kind of an adventure together. Most of the the commentators, the Bible scholars, think that they are going on a trip back up to the place where she was from in the northern part of Israel, as, as, they, uh, as Solomon is, is from the southern part, right? And so they're kind of doing like a weekend getaway here. And uh, as I pointed out when I started, here's our third way of uh, 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 how to just take this power of love that we have and handle it responsibly in our relationship, and that's to focus on the relationship. And maybe it takes what they're doing to get away together. I know sometimes for us, in my marriage, it takes that, that we have to, you know, get some time away from the kids and, and ministry and all the hustle and bustle of things so that we can really just focus and, and, and spend time. She's, she's like, just you and me. Let's go get away and have a sweet time of intimacy. And she does it in a kind of a creative way by talking about um, uh, flowers blooming and fruits and dried fruits. She's using sort of a play on words here uh, of like how things progress that way, that that's how her relationship is progressing too. So, uh, you know, you have a, a blossom that smells beautiful. It's sweet in one way. And then it turns into a cherry on a cherry tree, for example. And that cherry is sweet. But then, you know, the next phase would be dried cherries. And if you've ever thrown a handful of dried cherries in your mouth, it's like, whoa, you know, it's really power-packed sweetness. And so uh, the point I'm making is that she's using that analogy to express how their relationship is moving forward, that they're not just resting on something that they once had, that they're making sure that it continues to grow stronger over time, that it gets sweeter. You know, I see on Facebook uh, often uh, folks will post pictures of when they first got married, you know, on their anniversary. And uh, uh, 
sometimes it's hard to recognize them. It's like, you know, here's us 10 years ago. And you're like, really? That's him? Nice mullet, you know, or whatever. And, but I, I see those sometimes, and, and I wonder, uh, are they still in love? You know, they're posting the picture. That's awesome. They're still married. <laughs> are they still in love? Are they resting on, once, on what once was? I'll bet on that day it was pretty awesome for them. But what about over time? Is it growing stronger and stronger over time? You see, you guys, this doesn't just happen. It requires effort, and that's why we need to handle it responsibly. It's up to you. And I think it's also the same with our relationship with Jesus, and I keep trying to make these connections for you because I know that not all of you are married uh, or want to be. Uh, but at the same time, the bigger idea here is about our relationship with the Lord because that's even more important than our marriage. But if we're not careful over time, our relationship with Jesus can get stale. The Bible warns us repeatedly about that. Like if I just do the same things with him the way I always have, it might grow stale. And maybe you can consider this as you, you know, the place where you go to pray. Do you do it the same way all the time? You know, how you read your Bible. Do you just keep doing it the same way all the time or the way that you serve? Maybe there's another, a fresh way that God would have for you to do to keep your relationship with God fresh. It's super important uh, that you do that. And maybe you could approach your friendship uh, with God like you would a healthy marriage <laughs> to express your commitment towards him and, and focus some time uh, with him, as we've seen here. Okay, now beginning in chapter 8, uh, she is still talking, and she says there in verse 1, she says, Oh, that you were like my brother, who nursed at my mother's breasts. If I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to instruct me. I would cause you to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. Okay, now um, she's expressing her thoughts about him this time, before he expressed his thoughts about her. And now it's her turn here. And she's just talking. Uh, uh, in that day, public displays of affection were not allowed in ancient Israel. You couldn't, like, hold hands with your wife in public or kiss them in public. It just wasn't uh, allowed. But children could, <laughs> You know, because kids don't know any better, so they walk and hold hands or hug each other and, and whatever. And, and so she's saying that she just longs to be with, like that, with her husband. That any time, anywhere, I could just be openly, you know, show my love uh, for you. If, if you were my brother, I could express my feelings towards you. And so it's just more of that. I want everyone to know just how much... I love you. And she's using this as an example of a way uh, to say it. And so, you know, public displays of affection are good. You know, you couples that are married, you, you, I think you ought to sometimes, as long as you have a filter, right? <laughs> we need to have a PDA filter. Like if you guys are getting a little too amorous, maybe you need to go off someplace like they are, you know, and be by yourself. <laughs> uh, not too much there uh, around us. Well, uh, she speaks to her friends now in verses 3 and 4. It's the daughters of Jerusalem. And uh, he, she says, his left hand, speaking of her husband, is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Okay, um, again, we come back to the subject of establishing commitment. It's not, it's not only important to um, establish your commitment towards one another, but also for you that hope to be married one day, that you will establish commitment before anything physical happens between you and someone else. This is the third time that this warning in verse 4 has been in the Song of Solomon. So we need to pay attention to what it means. And it's talking about awakening sexual love before marriage. It ought not to be that way. 
And I think that she's saying it now because Song of Solomon has been pretty descriptive at times about, you know, the things that go on between two uh, married people, even though I've been doing kind of the PG version here um, with you, you guys. But the point that she keeps coming back to here is, is to save it for that one person that God has for you. Don't let the excitement and the pleasure that you read about here and that you know about rob you from waiting for that person. G. Campbell Morgan, who is a Bible teacher from some time ago, he said, love is so sacred a thing, it is not to be trifled with. And he's right. We need to handle this very responsibly. And so for you that aren't married yet, this is a big responsibility that you're given. From God's point of view, you can do damage, big damage, to the purpose that it was made for. And so, again, I say to you folks that are single and want to be married, guard this closely. Guard it. Okay, next here in verse 5, we'll see it tells us that a relative speaks. And we don't know who this is. But what does this relative have to say? Let's look at it together. He says, who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. Uh, As I said, she's probably returned to her childhood home where she's from. And now she runs into this uh, a family member who sees her coming leaning on her husband. And isn't that a really sweet point of view or something to see? Uh, to me, there, this is just says so much in just those few words. It's such an image of trust and dependency and just how we need each other. And, and so why you need to handle this so responsibly It's important that we help each other out, isn't it? You folks that are married, is it important that we help each other out and we lean on one another? I know my wife and I, we lean heavily on each other. Uh, I know that I need to first trust in the Lord and put my, put, put, you know, my hope in him. But I know that God has brought my wife into my life, that I can uh, lean on her, and she knows that about me. And we often say, you know, God gave you to me, and so I need your help. <laughs> you know, and we are going to lean on one another in a very healthy way. And of course, it doesn't take much to re- be reminded that the church leans heavily on Jesus Christ, don't we? You know, in a very real way, you've come out of the wilderness too, just like she has, and you're leaning on the everlasting arms of God. I often think about um, how God brought me out of the pit. I was sinking fast in quicksand as a young man, and God pulled me out of the pit because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And so he took me out of that pit, the quicksand that I was descending into hell, and he put me on the rock, the foundation of Jesus. And what a great day that was. And I'm just so grateful for him for doing it. And and then all through my life and all through your life, Christian, he just proves to us again and again uh, how much we can lean on him. And he wants you to lean on him every single day. He wants you to know that Regardless of what's going on, no matter how hard things are, no matter how big or small it is, that you can lean on him no matter what the thing may be. Praise the Lord. Isn't that great news? It's great news. Well, now in verses 6 and 7, she speaks to her guy, and she says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, Jealousy is cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, of most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Okay, she's relating to her guy, and also to us now, um, just how powerful love is. (laughs) And, you know, when you read through this, you begin to understand why we need to handle our love responsibly because look how powerful it is. She uses three images there to show just how powerful it is and to take it 
very seriously. Three things that she says are there is, is that it's strong as death, it's like a fire, and you can't buy it. So let me just go through those here briefly with you. Number one, it says that love is as strong as death. What does she mean by that? Well, it means that once love gets a hold of you, it never lets go. This is why people end up uh, in love with someone that they probably shouldn't be in love with because they started to go that way and then it gets a grip on them and then no earthly power can break that love. Just like no earthly power can break death. <laughs> Once somebody is dying, that's it. <laughs> no earthly power can break it. And so we have to uh, handle love responsibly because it's as strong as death. Uh, she said. She also says, number two there, that it's, a, it's like fire. And you can imagine um, how powerful fire is. We've seen it up in the mountains just burning all summer, right? It's still not out, that fire that's burning up uh, near Idaho City. Uh, it's so powerful, there's fire stations all over Meridian. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's because it can get out of control and and uh, uh, consume what's ever in its path. She says even if you have a flood of water, you know, you could, a flood of water can put out a fire, but it can't put out love, because love is strong. And then she also says there that, thirdly, that you can't buy it either. Money can't, can't buy me love, the Beatles said, and that's one of the things they got right. <laughs> you can't buy it, it's priceless. Why is love priceless? Because it's something that's given. It's something that's given. And um, when somebody loves you, they're giving you something that's priceless. And so we need to honor it. We need to respect it. We need to handle it responsibly, as I've been saying over and over again this morning. And think about this one. You need to be careful who you fall in love with. Uh, this comes across to us in living color in the Old Testament book of Judges uh, and the story of Samson and Delilah. You remember Samson and Delilah? Uh, Samson was a man of God who was kind of foolish in who he fell in love with. He fell in love with this gal that wasn't good for him at all, Delilah. And we find out later that all she really cared about was money. And she really sold him out to his enemies, the Philistines, uh, and, and, and really wanted to rob him of this God-given strength uh, that, he, that he had. And, and so um, when you read through that story of Samson and Delilah, you almost want to yell at Samson, what are you doing with her? <laughs> you know, why? Don't, don't pay attention to what she's trying to rip you off from, you know. But it's too late because Samson already loved her. And it's powerful. And uh, it ended up ruining him, cost him his life. And so it's a note for those of us to be careful who we fall in love with. But the Shulamite girl <laughs> singing this song, she isn't worried about any of that. Look at back at verse 6. She said, set me as a seal upon your heart, you know. She's like, take me wherever you go. I just, I love you so much. You're good to me. I want more of it. And uh, that's the way it, uh, it ought to be. Okay, now her brothers chime in here in verses 8 and 9. And they say, we have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Okay, uh, she's ta uh, it's taken a, a, time, a step back in time here uh, with her brothers how they were planning out their future of their sister. And you know, if, you got, if you're a guy and you had a little sister, maybe you did some of this. Like planning out when guys start to be interested in your sister, you know, in the future. She's young, she doesn't have breasts yet, so she's what, like seven, eight, nine, however old uh, that is. And, and their older brothers are just like looking out for her. They're saying, we're gonna protect her from creeps <laughs> that come along. And she uses, or they, I'm sorry, use a couple of metaphors to describe what they were going to do. They said if she's a door, meaning if she's a little too open or vulnerable to guys, she's not wise about these things, we will protect her fiercely. They said if she's more virtuous, like a wall, you know, then we'll reward her 
for that. The idea is that they're just looking out for their little sister. And uh, here's a good thing uh, for all of us that um, are entrusted with young people that we have a shared responsibility in helping them decide who they're going to date and who they're going to marry. And I'm probably talking to people who really know what I'm talking about. If you have uh, young adults in your family and have gone through this, but it's important that we invest in our kids to um, uh, share with them and point them towards the people that they uh, should be looking for. And, and we've done that with our daughters. <laughs> And uh, it's important to us that they at least have uh, uh, been trained up in the way that they should go, and then they can make a, an informed decision about who they date and who they marry. Well, listen to her answer next. Look at verse 10. She says, I'm a wall, <laughs> and my breasts like towers. <laughs> then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. Okay, I am done talking about breasts here. Last time. Doesn't mention them anymore. She's basically saying, I'm grown up now. You don't need to treat me like a little kid. I got this. I grew up. I found a man. I, I took your advice. I have peace with him now. I, I waited for the right guy, and he loves me. And, and so praise the Lord for that. And then she explains how it happened. Look at verses 11 and 12. She said, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Harmon. Uh, I'm sorry, Baal Hamon. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. Uh, and then she says to him directly, My own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruit, two hundred. She's saying in poetic language here, uh, talking about the value of Solomon's love for her. How much value and how valued she, she, she feels because he handled this great gift of love that he was given by God, he handled it responsibly toward this girl. You see, he had many vineyards up in that region where she was from, and he recognized the value of those, reg uh, those vineyards by paying people, as it says there, a great amount of money to tend those vineyards. And so what she does is she uses that example to say that, talking about her own value that she feels in him. Because what he's done is demonstrate that the most important vineyard to him was her. It's not the things that he owns, even though they're great in number, but she is valued. And now so, because of that, she's able to freely give herself to her husband. And isn't that great? And to me, that's how it ought to be. Well, let's finish the book here in the last two verses. And she says... Or he says, I'm sorry, you who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. And she responds. She gets the last word here. She says, make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Come and get me. You know. I read uh, somewhere that husbands and wives rate their happiness in direct correlation to how much they believe they are loved by their spouse. You have great power. It's a great responsibility. God demonstrated his own love towards us, and then while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And then what he does beyond that is he leads us into loving other people like that, especially the ones in your own home. And so we saw here in these chapters that they uh, express their love by not just thinking it, they said it to each other. It's so important to say it, to comment on the things that those people that you love, that you appreciate about them. And this doesn't just have to be about married couples. You know, we try to do that with our daughters. And we try to do that with our friends, you know, the things that we appreciate about them. And, and, and God gives us that ability to love, and so we should express it by saying it. Um, they also, we saw here, they reestablished their commitment uh, to one another. And it's not just something that you do once, you do it over and over again. Because as I said, um, people who know that their spouse is committed to them, it will empower them. They don't have to worry about that. And then of course we saw that they've spent focused time together too. And you can't 
um, emphasize or overemphasize that, to just spend time uh, together. And so maybe you guys can consider some of these intentional things. Um, number one, for the sake of your marriage, but ultimately for your relationship with God. And I'd like to close this book with uh, one last observation, and that's uh, through Song of Solomon, I think we can make a conclusion um, that God is not really asking us for our service or our money or our time. You know what God is really asking for? Our love. When you got love God back the way that he wants you to love him, then you will invest in things the way that you should. You will serve the way that you ought to. Your life will be how it ought to be. But he really wants your love. And what a good way to end this book. Just the emphasis to love God back. And I pray that that would be who we are. So would you guys stand with me? I'd like to do something a little bit out of the ordinary as the band comes up and we're going to sing one last song. And as we pray, um, would you guys do one thing for me? Would you just look around the room right now? Uh, Look around and look for, for someone in the room. Please do it. Just look around. I would like for you to pray for someone in this room for the next minute, somebody that you don't know. Just look around the room, pray for someone that they would know and experience God's power of love in their life. It's so important that we come to just understand more each day how much God loves us. And maybe you could pray for somebody that you don't even know, that you didn't come with, and uh, that God would uh, just reveal himself in a powerful way to them. So let's just pray for a moment, shall we? Yes, Lord, we just thank you so much for your love for us. It's hard to imagine that you would love us and that the lengths that you go to demonstrate it. And we just thank you for Song of Solomon. And I pray, Lord, that it would have blessed our our couples, uh, but also all the rest of us, too. Uh, Maybe those that are the single and don't want to be married, at least not at this point. And, And, Lord, I know that you call some people to be single and and, but love uh, transcends marriage. And so I just pray, God, that you would bless all the hearers, the readers today here in this place, and that that person who was just prayed for, um, especially the one that I was just thinking of and praying for, that you would bless their life and that um, they would experience your love like never before and uh, would empower us to live for you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.